Hello, B-Siders, and welcome back to track two. Our next presentation is titled Advanced Fishing Threats, Exploding Modern Features. Our speaker, Peyton Miller, joined the Open Security team after the completion of the Applied Cybersecurity Undergraduate Program at the SANS Institute of Technology. Having sharpened his pen testing skill set and garnering recognition across the industry through his participation in various capture the flag competitions, Peyton quickly set himself apart as a highly motivated self-starter. Thank you, Peyton, for being here today. I'm gonna pass you the controls. All right. Am I sure? Yeah. Thanks, JJ, for the introduction. And thank you guys for joining me with uh, Advanced Fishing Threats, uh, Exploiting Modern Features. I'm glad to be here. And honestly, it's great to see this type of turnout with these sides. So getting into it, as previously stated, I am a cybersecurity engineer with Open Security. I am my GSEC, GCIH, GPEN, and I have attained my education from SANS. But what wasn't mentioned was I absolutely love finding an obscure way to break web applications, um, legacy protocols, anything like that. Just obscure ways to either exceed our permissions or break the protocol altogether. So at a basic level, we need to get on the same page. What is phishing? So what are we trying to achieve? And to get into that, we need to understand a few things. First off, social manipulation. Now, maybe we're trying to achieve an convince you to disclose some type of information. This information can vary from, you know, your email and password, but it could also be something as trivial as what kind of applications your organization is running. Now, this type of information at face value may not, you know, it may not be dangerous. But as an attacker, if I can learn that you're using Office 365 or you're using VeriSign, I can create campaigns targeted around that concept. Now, this is usually deployed in two ways. First off, maybe we'll jump into a voice call with you and we'll act as your company's IT. That's called phishing. Meanwhile, we have phishing where we send you an email and we try to get you to interact with it and disclose some type of information that we can't find on our own. So phishing typically has two parts. And historically, this is range true. We have to give you some type of issue that pulls you in and gets you to engage with us. So maybe you need the new company benefits, you need to download an update, download the software, maybe you qualify for a stimulus check. You know, these are the types of things that if you get that in your inbox, you may or may not actually interact with. Now, in all of these cases, they work. And they work because we put deadlines. On average, phishing campaigns only have 23 hours if they're deployed in mass. So we have 23 hours to get you to click and fill out your information or download that software. As a society, building web applications and just creating this complex internet, where are we? So from an organizational standpoint, Organizations don't want people to buy domain names that are similar to theirs. So instead, they'll buy 10, maybe 20, in some cases, even 30 domain names. And they'll maintain these and have them redirect to the official web page. That's great. And it is a practice that we keep seeing time and time again. There's nothing vulnerable here until an attacker redirects to your homepage. And then that attacker gains trust because for years, maybe you start to think that you actually own that domain. And maybe your clients think that you own that domain. What's the difference? Historically, we've kind of shied away against disclosing information that shouldn't be shared. And this type of information is sitemac.xml and robots.txt. It can lead to the disclosure of information that we don't want you to find. But should we be exposing a list of all the services that our company actually owns? Another trend that we've seen, and this is picked up over time, is third-party APIs. I myself 
if I host a website, say it's a shop, I'm selling products. I don't want your credit card information. I don't want the liability that comes with that. If we get hacked, then I have to disclose to everyone, hey, you might want to get a new credit card. And there's fees for that. I do not want that liability of holding on to that type of personal information. So we'll use APIs. And so if you go to an untrusted site that you don't trust, and they have an API to a trusted service, will you trust that trusted service? We're relying on this untrusted site to provide a trusted service. It seems kind of backwards, doesn't it? So that's kind of led to consent-based phishing, in part. For example, Microsoft, you can create custom apps and you can delegate whatever permissions you would like. So in this case, if I was to install this application, it would be allowed to sign in as me, read my profile, my mail, send mail as me, and update my mailbox settings alongside everything else enumerated there. Are those really features that these APIs should be delegating or the permissions that should be delegated from these APIs? Maybe, maybe they are. Maybe that is a use case. I don't see why any application would need all of that information, but it is possible. Now, historically, we've had a few go-to methods, and one of those is typo domain squatting. So let's say we want to buy a domain like Google, google.com. We can remove some letters, maybe take out an O. Maybe we duplicate letters, and we have three O's or two L's. We can also try google.net or Google in different top level domains. Or we can look for services that they own, like googleapis.com. And then we can try to name things around their naming convention. Now, as you can see here, this is a very which is available in the GitHub that was posted into the Discord. But you can see we can very quickly enumerate different types of domain, name, domain names that may or may not have legitimacy backing them. And so a lot of these are available, which is the horrifying thing. And you can buy these for 20, maybe $30 in some cases. We also have internationalized domain names. Now, internationalized domain names is the usage of symbols within the domains or alt character sets. For example, the Twitter one there, um, you can see in the symbolic domain name table, twitter.com is entirely made of Cyrillic characters. Now, this was a very big vulnerability in finding back in 2015, 2016. The issue was that looks convincing. So what we've done is we've created this puny code and it's Unicode, but URL safe. And so anytime you access one of these symbolic domain names, it will convert to the puny code equivalent. And that should, in most cases, at least for web browsers, it will protect you. In recent times, Chrome, by default, converts every request to the puny code equivalent. That's interesting, but it's still abusable. We can send mail <laughs> from Twitter.com, even though we don't own twitter.com, but we own the Cyrillic version. With this type of use case, we'd recommend um, say, staying in one character set. And it's interesting because if you look at this, it does say sign by the puny code equivalent domain. But to some unknowing victim, even if they analyze this, they won't know what that meant. And that's the issue with security. While puny code and internationalized domains are inherently untrusted, we can still send email as those services globally. Okay. Now, I will take a step back. I do feel 100% comfortable disclosing Microsoft.com and Twitter because, frankly, I am never getting those back. Um, as you can see, I received this really nice email about about um, the identification of phishing activities on my domains in preparation for this conference. It's kind of interesting. And as you can see, this legitimate email is going to cancel my domain registrations or terminate my account 
if I don't take action in three days. Now that's interesting. That sounds a lot like a lot of the phishing campaigns and the identifiers of phishing. In fact, I may actually use this as a phishing campaign down the road. But in this case, it is a truly legitimate message. And understandably, do not host phishing content or your domains will be seized. And you will not be getting them back. But what can we do? What can we do with this complex internet and how can we achieve legitimacy? So there's a few techniques. And if we start out, we can try to use vulnerabilities to inherit trust. And it has an open redirection on it. We can send you a link that is test.com slash redirect question mark URL equals our site. And because they clicked a link to your site or sorry, to test.com, and now you're redirected to site, which is attacker.co. You inherently trust my website because why else would this trusted site redirect to? Other examples of this would be cross-site scripting. We can try to steal your credentials, obviously, which that makes phishing campaigns really easy when we identify that. Or we can try to redirect to our site or inject a login form or set up any ruse we want under your domain name. That's powerful. Some other abusable services that form apps on behalf of the user. We have link shorteners. Now, in the case of Twitter, it's t.co. And we need that because Twitter, you only have so many characters, you want shortened links. Um, file hosting, if we host products on safe and secure um, services that are inherently trusted, then we can send malware from those. In the case on the left here, in that image, we have facebook.me slash a ton of numbers. Now, I genuinely don't know if that is Facebook marketing or whether or not that's a phishing campaign and that's a reflective uh, redirection. I don't know. Another service we can do if we don't want to do the domain popping, we can do subdomains. Um, Google and Firebase, they can tell you .web.app and .firebase.com. So you can own any service you want as long as you fit their naming schemes for what a subdomain should be. But these things are free. Um, to be fair, the file hosting is not. The web is a complex place. And as we start to understand this, we have to think about how these applications work. And one example that comes to mind is meeting platform software. So for example, if I have email and it links directly into um, my calendar, can an external entity send me a meeting invite? Well, yeah, they should be able to. And what if they don't use the same meeting platform as me? Can they send me a link to a nefarious meeting software installation? And then receive that and I'm like, hey, I got a meeting in 15 minutes. What's the implicit trust that I'm going to click that link and download that software because I'm expected to be in that meeting? And these are the types of things that we're trying to identify and we're trying to find that these modern phishing campaigns can just use the internet. It's just that simple. Something that's kind of controversial is the use of safe links and link filtering. So what this actually is, is a redirection through Outlook's safe link protocol. And it's a open redirection as long as the rest of the data in that um, URL is valid. The issue here is if I click that, I have no idea where I'm going. In the black box there, you can see I've kind of highlighted um, HTTP, um, some parentheses symbols, google.com. That's the URL encoded form of google.com. But as you can see, it, it's a lot. And if I receive a ton of emails a day, I'm not spending the time looking for what the URL actually is. This is a default protection. And frankly, I think it makes our users normalize trusting random links because they don't know where they are going. We can also do subdomain impersonation. Now, subdomains by default, 
they have few character sets. You can do A through Z, zero through nine, hyphens, underscores, and you can use periods as delineators. You also have up to 253 characters on most registrars, or DNS providers, rather, to type whatever you would like. OK. So this is a valid subdomain. Interesting. This is also a valid subdomain. Huh. So how can we start to use this? Well, here's an example. That's not very convincing. You know, it could be https.steam.com. And just to prove it, all of these are completely valid subdomains. And I did blur my actual domain name there, of course. So how can we achieve impersonation? So first off, we want to find a trusted website with a really long URL. We open our impersonator. We run a script, and we update the DNS. It's just that simple. Now, what the script does, and it is, again, provided on the GitHub that I linked there, it runs a few regex expressions to replace equals with hyphen, delete HTTP or HTTPS, replace a few special characters with hyphens, and then delete any of the bad characters that shouldn't be there. So now we have this. Is this a legitimate domain name? Um, is this discordapp.com's CDN? And at first, you may actually think it is. But no. In this case, our domain name is actually test.com. The only real way to identify that is the lack of characters that we can put. We can't put slashes. But we can put a ton of periods. And so at first impression, this could look relatively legitimate. And the worst part is, instead of test.download, we could have any domain in existence. We could have it short. We could have id-numbers.com. It really depends. One of my favorite techniques personally is left to right overrides and right to left overrides. Now, I don't think this classification vulnerability has been given a proper shot. I don't think it's been given a proper chance. If you actually look into this, it's very hard to find anything that actually uses it. Usually you'll find a three or four line synopsis of what it does. So we'll get into it. By default, in the English language, text goes from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. And in some languages, such as Arabic, Hebrew, it's the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen. Now on Windows, we've determined that why can't we do both at once? And we can. So we can have left to right and right to left at the same time. Now, why is that an issue? Well, as you can see here, what we can actually do is completely shift the file extension anywhere in the file name, or at least that's what's rendered to the user. Now, this is a little bit complex, but as you can see, the first record there, or row in the table, it looks like a dot docs. It looks like a Word document. In reality, it's an executable. And the second one is the use case that's commonly seen with right to left overrides, is that you slide the extension one spot over. But this is so much more powerful. Instead of having dot link dot docs, we could have dot JS, a long file name, dot PDF. And you may or may not think it's a PDF, depending on the rendering. And finally, my personal favorite, Amazon.com. Now, .com files actually execute on modern Windows as .exes. So that's really interesting because we're able to achieve execution by using web addresses. And as you can see here, this is actually how you type it out. It is a little bit complex, and you do have to play with it a little bit. But as previously stated in the GitHub repository that I linked there, there is an HTML file that will generate most of these for you. It does take a little bit tinkering just because of um, the weird rendering. But a lot of the times, it will get you the, most of the way there. Now, this is interesting, because if we have file, names, uh, file name extensions disabled, we can no longer th see things such as executive summary. It hides the exe. 
But in the case of Amazon with .com, this is really powerful because now instead of Amazon, just Amazon, and that's still trustworthy. We also have um, 2021 executive summary. If we enable the file name extensions, and that looks relatively legitimate itself, um, or Amazon.com space dash invoice.pdf. Now, what other applications does this have? Well, frankly, if we can send email, we can write anything we want in the from header. And so what that means is that potentially we could flip a domain name. Maybe we don't actually own Microsoft.com, but we can allocate a non-spoofed email address from there. And because it's not spoofed, maybe that will give our email legitimacy and it won't send it to the spam list. Um, another example looks inside of a zip file and displays what type of file names are inside of it. And as you can see here, we have amazon.com, space dash, and voice.docs. Even though everybody here knows that's actually a .com file which executes as a .exe. So how do we protect ourselves on the internet? What can we do? Well, to protect individuals, we'd recommend a password manager and URL matching. What that does is whenever you type in your password, if you are on a fictitious domain name, it won't allow your password manager to automatically type in your password for you. And you might be able to identify that you are on a malicious website. We also have two-factor authentication. The real benefit of this is if you think that something needs to be done right away, you'll type in your username and password. But if there's 2FA implemented, you'll take out your phone, you'll pull up your authenticator app, and you'll think about it for a sec. And maybe that's just long enough to rethink typing in your credentials and that token. We also have safe site scanners. In the security industry, it is kind of a running joke, but they do detect brand new and new registered domains as malicious. And it was found that 33% of phishing campaigns on an actual domain were registered within a month of use. That might be sufficient protection to protect you. If you're worried about Windows spoofing, where an adversary uses CSS styles or modifications to the web browser to emulate another web browser opening, you can use custom Chrome things. Historically, a great recommendation is if you can avoid clicking a link, um, Google or navigate directly to the website and see if you can find the page yourself. That way, if there is a cross-site scripting or other threat, it's mitigated because you're not clicking the link with the malicious payload. And finally, regular internal training to ensure that your organization can identify a large range of, uh, of threats and regular training and security. The threat landscape does change over time and we need to identify that and be on top of it. Finally, to protect your organization, here's a few recommendations. If you do have a domain that's being used for a mail server, ensure that your DNS records are valid and up to date. Reduce unnecessary domain redirections. So maybe you shouldn't point everything at your homepage or at whatever your organization's top level domain really is. Maybe we want to expose a list of what services we actually own or some type of endpoint that we can query that. Now this does have other benefits, um, although it would have to be maintained. We could implement logging. And so if a lot of people began querying a fictitious or phishing domain, Maybe we can take action on that before people lose their credentials. And finally, maintaining web servers with regular vulnerability assessments and ensuring that your external services are secure. I've linked a few additional resources if you want to do any further research on your own um, and some links to blogs that I found interesting while researching the topic and doing my own investigations. Um, finally, I know we are close on time, so if you do have any questions that haven't been answered at this point and you want to, reach out to me on Twitter or Discord or follow up with me in the Open Security channel afterwards.
All scripts that I've mentioned are available in the GitHub that is both published in the Discord chat and enumerated right there. So.